Greetings YouTubers and welcome to, yes, part six in the Backcountry Water Treatment Series. And if you haven't seen the others, I always recommend you watch them in order as each part tends to build upon concepts introduced previously. This video is on UV disinfection, which is to say the reduction of pathogens in drinking water through exposure to ultraviolet light. Now that might sound a bit like science fiction, it also might not seem practical as a backcountry option, but the idea has been formally considered. In 2019, the Wilderness Medical Society convened a panel of experts to develop guidelines for water disinfection in remote settings. Ultraviolet light was one of the treatment methods discussed. UV light comes in a variety of wavelengths, similar to the color spectrum, and while all UV light is invisible to the eye, it still gets categorized into various bands depending upon that wavelength. You may be most familiar with UVA and UVB bands, as those are the ones involved with sunburns and sunscreen, but the UVC is the one known as the germicidal band, because it contains the wavelengths most effective at inactivating pathogens. So, when they talk about UV disinfection, they're talking about UVC in the range of 200 to 280 nanometers. At sufficient doses, UV radiation can inactivate all three types of waterborne pathogens, but not equally. So among the issues to be considered with this type of treatment are the relative effectiveness versus cysts, bacteria, and viruses, the impact of water condition, mainly temperature and turbidity, the impact of correct procedure, including agitation and bottle type, and safety issues like exposure to UVC light or the possibility of reinfection in your water. So I will do my best to address each of these topics. Now this article from the Water Research Center provides a sort of overview of UV disinfection as a technology. And basically, ultraviolet radiation disinfects by disrupting the DNA within microorganisms. It doesn't physically remove the microbes the way a filter would, or kill them the way heat and chemicals can. So yes, the germs are still in your water, and they're still alive. They just can't reproduce anymore, so they won't be able to make you sick even though you drink them. The low pressure mercury arc lamps emit a nearly monochromatic UV radiation at a wavelength of 254 nanometers, which is in the optimum range for UV energy absorption by nucleic acids. And that's what gives this wavelength its peak germicidal efficiency against microbial DNA. Now, one of the issues with using UV is the turbidity of your water. Cloudiness can block the light and reduce its effectiveness. The Water Research Center states that when turbidity reaches 5 NTUs, uh, a 5 to 20 micron pre-filter is highly recommended. And if you like to be that guy around the campfire, you can tell everyone that NTUs stands for Nephilometric Turbidity Units. For a practical idea what that means, MSR's blog has a nice comparison of water samples ranging from 5 NTUs to 500. And according to Cornell University Cooperative Extension, UV light's effectiveness is reduced after the level of turbidity exceeds 5 NTUs, which, according to the graphic, looks surprisingly clear. So just something to keep in mind when you come across a water source that looks like this. Also, dissolved natural organic matter will absorb UV radiation or shield microbes from UV radiation, resulting in lower delivered UV doses and reduced microbial disinfection. Again, some sort of pre-filter is highly recommended. Used alone, UV radiation does not improve the taste, odor, or clarity of water. And since it doesn't remove anything from the water, UV won't reduce chemicals, heavy metals, or other impurities. And if any of those things are a concern, consider an activated carbon or adsorption filter like those discussed in part five. First of all, it's an electronic gadget. And you get with that the possibility of some of the usual idiosyncrasies that one might be familiar with. Outdoor Gear Lab did a review of the Steripen Ultra. Catadyne calls it their flagship model with our most advanced user interface featuring a user-friendly OLED display. But Gear Lab experienced the Steripen glitching out on longer runs, forcing them to resort to chemical treatment that they had fortunately brought as a backup. And regarding that most advanced user-friendly interface, even on a full battery charge, Gear Lab experienced the sad face icon indicating treatment failure for, quote, no reason. And the review concluded, like everything electrical, it's not the most reliable in the backcountry and more suited for situations that won't leave you wondering if you'll survive or not. And they end up scoring it a 3 out of 10 for durability and maintenance. Another potential issue is finicky battery life. 
The SteriPen Ultra has a built-in rechargeable lithium-ion battery, which Catadyne says gives approximately 50 treatments per charge. McGear Lab noted they were getting about half that, especially in colder weather. With 25 treatments being 25 liters of water, at 6 liters per day, you're talking about a potential 4 days worth of service between charges. If I was relying on one of these for my drinking water, I'd make sure to bring some sort of battery bank as backup, just in case I need to recharge before the next resupply. Now, when you have a device with a built-in non-replaceable battery, there's the issue of the lifetime number of recharges. In this case, we need to compare the battery pack's service life to that of the UV lamp itself. Catadyne specifies the bulb for 8,000 activations. If we use GearLab's pessimistic estimation of 25 activations per charge, you're in the range of needing 320 recharge cycles from your battery. Well, according to Tektronix's maintenance guidelines, the typical estimated life of a lithium-ion battery is about 2-3 to three years or 300-500 to 500 charge cycles, whichever occurs first. And that seems fairly well matched. About the time your bulb is running out, the battery is giving up. However, if you prefer the reliability and versatility of replaceable batteries, Sterpen offers the Classic 3 model, which runs on four commonly available AA cells. Another physical vulnerability of these devices is the bulb itself. The Water Research Center cautions if material builds up on the glass sleeve or the particle load is high, the light intensity and the effectiveness of treatment are reduced. So, Keep the bulb clean to maximize its capability to reduce pathogens in your water. And of course, if not handled carefully, the bulb can break. And that brings up a serious question. If UV lamps are mercury vapor, and that lamp breaks during water treatment, what's your risk of exposure? Well, in 2006, the military produced a report on ultraviolet light disinfection in the use of individual water purification devices, or IWPDs. In the report, they address the issue of mercury exposure. And the EPA sets the maximum contaminant level for mercury at 0 0.002 milligrams per liter. That's two thousandths of a thousandth of a gram of mercury in a liter of water. Above that, there is the risk of kidney damage from even a short-term exposure. According to the report, even the low-pressure UV lamps used in IWPDs can release from 5 to 50 milligrams of mercury into your water if broken during treatment. And Catadyne doesn't specify how much mercury is in their bulb. My manual for the Classic 3 only says, As with other fluorescent-type lamps, Classic 3 contains a small amount of mercury. Well, suppose that it's only 2 milligrams. That's still a thousand times more than the EPA's maximum level. So if for whatever reason the bulb breaks on you, discard the water, isolate the device, and wash both your hands and the container in question. And then resort to your backup treatment method. Because you brought a backup, right? So, you've got your pre-filter to get the water as clear as possible before you start. And you've got your backup batteries if the power fails. And you've got a secondary method in case anything else goes wrong. You're ready to irradiate some drinking water. But I can hear you asking. What is the actual pathogen reduction performance? Okay then, here comes the numbers. From the Water Research Center, Table 1 shows a variety of bacteria and viruses. It gives the exposure time in seconds for a 100% lethality from a UV dosage of 30,000 microwatt seconds per square centimeter. And as you can see, there can be a significant amount of variation between the times it takes to inactivate various pathogens. There is more than a hundredfold difference between the quickest and the slowest, just among viruses in this list. Unfortunately, none of the devices I looked at provide numbers for the UV intensity of their lighting system, so this information can't really be compared to the performance of any particular product. But it serves to illustrate the point that you have to be careful when talking about pathogen reduction performance. It can matter a great deal which particular microorganisms that you're dealing with. And for the numbers junkies, Table 2 shows the data put another way. In this case, we have the UV dose required to produce a 4-log inactivation of a list of pathogens. And for an explanation of what a log of inactivation means, I recommend starting with Part 1 of this series and continuing in order. The log removal values are discussed throughout, and I try to provide some perspective about the amount of log reduction that might be useful in the backcountry. If you thought all EPA-approved filters were essentially equivalent in their ability to make water safer, or that 99.9% .9 removal was enough, I urge you to check out the rest of the videos in this series. 
But for a quick review, a log of removal, which comes from logarithm, is a 90% reduction. So if you had 100 pathogens in your bottle, treating it with a one log filter would remove 90 germs, leaving you with 10 left to drink. Two logs of removal is 99%. Three would be 99.9%. Four equals 99.99, .99, and on it goes. So what this table is saying then is that a UV dose of 8.2 millijoules per square meter would inactivate 99.99% of salmonella. And again, I can't get the actual dose capability of these products, so this is still rather academic, but it also illustrates another point. It is said that, generally speaking, UV is most effective against cysts, followed by bacteria and slowest to work on viruses. This study, published in Applied and Environmental Microbiology, looked at the efficacy of UV irradiation in inactivating Cryptosporidium parvum oocysts. The authors show that there's a logarithmic relationship between UV dose and infectivity. As the dose increases linearly, the relative infectivity drops by powers of 10. That's great as long as you're talking about making the light brighter, but it becomes a cause for concern if things are going in the opposite direction. Now, from the Water Research Center, UV lights gradually lose effectiveness with use. The lamp should be cleaned on a regular basis and replaced at least once a year. It's not uncommon for a new lamp to lose 20% of its intensity within the first 100 hours of operation, although that level is maintained for the next several thousand hours. So recall some of the numbers for the SteriPen Ultra, which is rated for 8,000 activations at 90 seconds each. That's 720,000 seconds or 200 hours of lamp time. If we assume the SteriPen's lamp is not immune to this effect, fully half of the device's rated life is after this potential 20% decline in intensity. And because of the logarithmic relationship between dose and infectivity, a 20% drop in lamp brightness makes more than a 20% drop in reduction performance. And I couldn't get intensity over time data for SteriPen's UV lamp, so this is all speculative, but it's something to think about if you're planning on using such a device for the long term. And something else to be aware of was the study's findings on the effect of water temperature on performance. And this graph shows the relative infectivity per dose plotted for 5 degrees Celsius, as well as 10 degrees and 30. Now, it's not a huge difference, but if you wanted to account for it, the authors summarized the effect as a 7% decrease in infectivity reduction for every 10 degrees drop in water temperature. So when comparing chemical disinfection to UV, it's often pointed out that a key difference is the presence of any residual protection. With chemicals, even after the target treatment time has elapsed, the active ingredients remain. And they will continue to disinfect at ever-increasing log removal values the longer you let the concoction brew. And that means it also provides you with some residual protection against the reinfection of your water. And remember that these reduction values are all of the 99.99 .99 sort. They're never truly 100%. The probability persists that some few live pathogens will always be left over. As long as they are below the minimum infective dose, you should be okay. But if you let that water sit for long enough, the possibility exists that the living germs remaining might begin to regrow, effectively recontaminating your water to the point where it's infective again. Now for more on chemical disinfection, see part two. And for discussion of minimum infective dose plus statistics on the probability of infection before and after treatment at various log removal rates, see parts three and four. Now, because UV doesn't actually kill the microbes in question, that brings up one other area of possible concern. What UV light does is disrupt the DNA, preventing germs from replicating. And the issue with leaving live but damaged pathogens in your water is that living things can be quite persistent. And there are all kinds of mechanisms by which even microorganisms can repair their DNA. Now, some of these repair methods will even work in the complete absence of light, a phenomenon known as dark repair. So, the crypto study looked at what happens to the log reduction of UV inactivated oocysts when stored in the dark for a number of hours after treatment. Unfortunately, they found that there was essentially no effective repair, even after 24 hours. And given these results, the effects of UV irradiation on C. parvum oocysts, as determined by animal infectivity, can conclusively be considered irreversible. And then lastly, with respect to Cryptosporium specifically, the study addressed the issue of existation versus infectivity. 
The crypto is a parasite that's encountered in its cyst form. The actual parasites are encapsulated within a protective shell, which lets them survive in the environment. When you drink some of these oocysts, they emerge from this shell to replicate in your guts and infect you. The authors found that in order to prevent this existation, it requires a, quote, extremely high dose of UV. However, infectivity was reduced at much lower doses because the crypto inside still gets inactivated. So basically, it's too hard to prevent the parasites from coming out of their shells by irradiation. You're in the position of having to drink the oocysts and let the parasites emerge inside you. But since their DNA has been damaged beyond repair, they shouldn't be able to make you sick. Okay, enough theory already. What about the performance of actual devices? Well, as far as products available and practical for the backcountry, there's really only one that I'm aware of at this time. Catadine's aforementioned Sterapin. Though I did look at a couple of UV LED bottles to be discussed at the end. So regarding performance, you know me by now, I want lab tests. So this report from ANL Labs tested the Sterapin against MS2 coliphage according to the EPA's protocols. Recalling from parts 4 and 5, MS2 is a virus that infects E. coli bacteria and it's commonly used as a proxy in tests for human viral pathogens. Per protocol, the tests are run with both a general test water and a challenge water, described here in the report. So note the turbidity of the challenge water is given as 33 NTUs, compared to only 0.3 for the general sample. So here's what those samples looked like side by side. The stair pen was then inserted and the samples were illuminated while being stirred per the manufacturer's instructions. The results are presented in tables 3 and 4. Average reduction across three trials for the general test water was almost three and a half logs. And for the challenge water, the turbidity and dissolved solids dropped that to below three. To me, that challenge water looks like what I would call only mildly cloudy. And just keep this performance drop in mind should you encounter water like Matt found in New York on the Appalachian Trail or the stuff Exploring Wild had to drink on the Arizona Trail. These come more from the far left end of the scale than in the middle. The military study included a table on the effect of increasing turbidity to UV transmission and absorbance, and the resulting increase in exposure time needed to maintain an effective dose. The jump from almost clear water to just 20.1 NTUs required a 21% increase in exposure time. So that would mean an extra 18.9 seconds on one of Steropen's standard 1 liter treatments you'd have to click once for an additional half treatment to make sure you're continuing to meet standards. And it only gets worse the murkier the water gets. Now those of you that have been following the series are probably already raising an objection. And didn't I say the EPA standard for microbiological water purifiers is four logs of removal for viruses? Why yes, yes I did. But these lab results are both less than four logs, even the one for the general test water. Won't that fail to meet the EPA's requirement? Here's how the report addresses that. Studies have shown that a 2.3 log reduction of MS2 coliphage after UV treatment is equivalent or greater than a 6 log of bacterial pathogens and a 4 log reduction of viral pathogens. And they note that MS2 has been compared to common pathogens like hepatitis A, rotavirus, and polio. Of all these organisms, MS2 coliphage was found to be the most resistant to UV radiation. Okay, I see where they're going. If MS2 is harder to treat than these other pathogens, then being able to adequately inactivate MS2 means you're as good, if not better, at inactivating these. And the concept seems sound enough, but I have two problems remaining. Problem number one, on its face, the reduction of MS2 isn't adequate. MS2 is a virus, and as mentioned, the EPA standard for purifiers requires a 4-log reduction of viruses. And the lab results show a 3.44 and a 2.96 reduction, neither of which meets the 4-log minimum. So, they invoke a studies have shown line to say that a 2.3-log reduction of super tough MS2 is equivalent to a 4-log reduction of other viral pathogens. It's a fudge factor. The number that looks too low is actually higher after we corrected it. I'm teasing them a bit, but it's theoretically a legitimate adjustment to make, but I want to see the data that justifies it. And the reference is given, but it does not look like that of a peer-reviewed study. There's no publication listed. 
From what I can gather, this may have been a conference presentation at the university and not an actual published study. I was not able to find any transcript to verify this fudge factor is being applied correctly. Now moving on to problem number two, it says that MS2 has been found to be most resistant when compared to common microbial contaminants and pathogens. Now always dissect these statements for exactly what they say and what they don't say. Now built into the statement is the admission that MS2 has not been compared to all pathogens. So, if there's a virus more resistant to UV than MS2, then those log reductions below the EPA limit really could reflect inadequacy in the face of all possible microbial threats. Oh, off I go down the next rabbit hole. I found a study published in 2015 on waterborne viruses in drinking water. And the authors state, human adenovirus is nearly five times more resistant to monochromatic UV inactivation compared to other enteric viruses. I noted that adenovirus is not one of the viruses the SteriPen lab report claimed was less resistant to UV than MS2. And that's because adenoviruses can be even more resistant to UV inactivation than MS2. So going back to the military report, Table 2 provides a list of microorganisms in the UV dose required for 3-log and 4-log inactivation of each. And there is MS2. It requires 71 millijoules per square meter of UV light for the EPA-required inactivation rate of 99.99%. And true to the claims in the SteriPen lab report, it takes a higher dose to treat MS2 than polio or hepatitis. But look who's on top. MS2 is not the most UV-resistant virus. Adenovirus type 40 is. It takes 169% greater dose to inactivate adenovirus type 40 than that required for MS2. To my mind, that unravels the claim that MS2 inactivation rates below the EPA standard can somehow be extrapolated as adequate reduction of all viral threats. That might be true for the things easier to treat than MS2, but it can't be for adenovirus type 40. The SteriPen lab report used the word common in its claim of MS2 having been compared to relevant pathogens. I'm not sure even this implication is true. Adenovirus type 40 specifically is considered a common cause of gastroenteritis. In fact, adenovirus is the second most common virus causing gastroenteritis in young children in the UK. So let's go back to the SteriPen lab report and reconsider those test results. Even in the general test water, the log reduction was only 3.4. That's less than the EPA's minimum of four logs for viral reduction. And it was suggested that we should treat that low score as effectively higher than it was, but we've seen that one of the most common waterborne viruses out there is significantly tougher than their proxy organism. So we could expect the results against adenovirus type 40 to be even worse than what's shown here. And all of this is in the clear water of the general test. It only gets worse when things get cloudy. The part four discusses in detail the real world concentrations of viruses you might encounter in the backcountry and the potential value of log removals of five or more. So personally, I don't find logs of less than three and a half very comforting. Unfortunately, there's a fairly easy way to compensate for potentially inadequate reductions. Zap it again. Just because the manufacturer's instructions prescribe one 90 second treatment per liter doesn't mean you can't light it up a second time or even a third. Perhaps recognizing that the results weren't that great, the lab report also shows log reductions for two treatments at 180 seconds of irradiation and for three full cycles with a total of four and a half minutes under the lamp. And as you can see, they were eventually able to exceed six logs of inactivation, even in the murkier challenge water. So for me, so far, the takeaways are UV disinfection is not science fiction, the technology is real, and it's capable of significant pathogen reduction when performed appropriately but there are a lot of caveats to be aware of in order to use it safely in the field. A second report by the same lab investigated another potential issue that can arise when dealing with electronic devices. And as your batteries die, they lose voltage. And in the case of an electric light, the lamp can lose brightness as the voltage drops. And with a disinfection method that relies on the power of its light, that can affect pathogen reduction. So for its testing, the military uses NSF protocol P248, which is a tougher standard for microbiological water purifiers than that of the EPA. 
So using U.S. Army one liter canteens, the lab ran the standard tests for both the general and challenge test water. But under P248, they did it at both normal device voltage and the lowest possible voltage at which the device would still operate. And they did this by rigging the stair pin up to a DC power supply to simulate a low battery condition. So here are the results at normal voltage, still using MS2 as a proxy organism. One 90 second dose of UV for a liter of the general test water resulted in about three logs of inactivation. And interestingly, even after two doses, the challenge water only experienced a reduction of about two and a half logs. Then they ran the tests again at low voltage. The differences aren't huge, but they're measurable. And with the challenge water at low voltage, you're down to less than 2.4 logs, even after three minutes of irradiation. The virus results for this little filter right here are more than a thousand times better than that. No batteries required. The SteriPen has also been the subject of a scientific study published in 2015 in the Journal of Travel Medicine and Infectious Disease. The authors investigated reduction performance using three different bottle types common to use in the outdoors. They did a wide mouth Nalgene, an aluminum bottle, and a typical PET plastic disposable similar to the popular smart water bottle. All had a capacity of one liter. Using the Nalgene, they tested against three different microorganisms. Staphylococcus aureus, the stuff that causes staph infections, and E. coli or bacteria, while the last one is a bacterial spore. Note that these are not laboratory proxies like MS2, they're actual pathogens. So each set of germs was tested at different concentration levels in the water, and table two shows the results. At lower concentrations, none of the bacteria remained viable, and some of the spores did, which are known to be more resistant to UV disinfection. But you can't really calculate a log reduction if the results are zero. You need some left over to see just what percent were treated. So looking at the top test, they got 3.8 logs of reduction for E. coli. So if you've been following the series, you're familiar with E. coli from previous videos. It's the actual field marker for fecal contamination. See part 3 on microfiltration for a discussion of actual concentrations of E. coli tested in the wilderness, along with the probability of infection from drinking contaminated water before and after varying amounts of log reduction. As a reminder, the EPA's minimum standard for bacterial reduction from a water purifier is 6 logs. Now that's over 100 times more than what was achieved here, and your typical Sawyer filter provides over 10,000 times as much protection. Something to keep in mind with the application of UV light for disinfection is the principle of intensity versus time. It's not just the number of seconds you irradiate your sample. The intensity or brightness of the exposure is the other half of the equation. In UV, exposure is measured in IT numbers, very much the way chemical exposure was measured in CT numbers. And see part two for details on how CT numbers can help calculate treatments for chemical disinfection. And with chemicals, you could change both the concentration of your solution and the number of minutes you let the concoction soak. With UV, you don't directly control the brightness of the bulb. All you do is change the treatment time. Now, that doesn't mean intensity is not still a variable though. So going back to your high school physics, remember when they talked about the inverse square law of illumination? And you never thought you'd use that again. And don't worry, we're not about to do a bunch of math, it's just the principle that counts. That principle was that the energy intensity from a light source drops off with the square of your distance from it. So get twice as far away, and the light doesn't dim to half of what it was, it goes down to a quarter. And three times away, intensity has dropped to one ninth. In other words, energy exposure decreases exponentially with distance from the light source. So with UV, the disinfection is based on the intensity of illumination. The further a microbe is away from the bulb, the less energy it receives. And the less energy it receives, the lower its percentage of reduction will be. Uh, since the pen only ever pokes into the top of your container, bottle shape could become a factor. Even with two one liter bottles, the distance to the bottom is greater with one design than the other. The stair pen accounts for this with their instructions to stir while illuminating the water. This will presumably help microbes from all areas within experience similar exposure to the radiation. In the tips for safe use section, it states, 
agitation of water by stirring Classic 3 or rocking the container is necessary as it promotes uniform purification. The study authors investigated the importance of this by testing all three of their bottle types with both calm and properly agitated water. Table 3 shows what they found. Using a lower concentration of E. coli, correct application resulted in no remaining viable pathogens. But in all three cases, failure to agitate the water during exposure resulted in less than two logs of reduction, less than even one log with the aluminum bottle. So again, see part three for details, but that's not anywhere near enough to keep you safe from contaminated water. Regarding the effective distance from the bulb on disinfection capability, the authors took water samples after each treatment from both the top of the bottle and the bottom. And with the Nalgene, for example, without agitating, the water near the bulb was still disinfected to zero remaining pathogens. But the water at the bottom of the container was found to still contain 231 colony forming units of bacteria per 1,000 microliters. The difference between the top and the bottom was even greater with the taller aluminum bottle. And one curious aspect of their findings was the result for the PET bottle. Despite being the tallest of the three, its top to bottom difference was by far the smallest. And weirder still is its mixed value was actually higher than the bottom measurement. And if the water gets progressively less disinfected the farther down you go, you would expect the value of the water after it's mixed together to be somewhat less than the worst value taken from the bottom, as it was for both the Nalgene and the SIG. But not so for the PET bottle. The only way that could be true is if some of the microbes in the middle, which were technically closer to the light source, somehow ended up less disinfected than the farthest ones at the bottom. Well, how could that be? Well, the authors speculated that it had to do with the shape of the bottle's contours and the irregular internal reflections that result. And as you see these patterns of light, realize that this is going on inside as well. Wherever there may be a dark spot is a place where the germs in your water aren't getting the same UV burn as the rest. Bottom line, it's important to agitate the water during treatment. Don't think you can just mix it up afterwards. And that brings up one last procedural detail to consider, the proper way to agitate. The standard image of treatment is the one that Sterapin uses, a container with a nice wide opening in which you can easily stir the lamp during exposure. But this is the container that more and more people are using on trail. In the study, they also looked at the effectiveness of stirring with a Sterapin inside the neck of a narrow mouth bottle. In this case, they used the aluminum SIG. During the procedure, the bottle itself was standing still. On average, this method of agitating the water only yielded a germ reduction of 88.93%. In essence, such restricted stirring was as bad as not agitating the water at all. So what's the right way? You actually invert the bottle over the lamp and swish the whole thing around until the light goes out. This was the correct application method of agitation used to achieve those results we saw in Table 3. If you're not doing it that way, you may not be getting the disinfection you expected. And as you can see, the Classic 3 model comes with this tapered rubber base that acts like a plug. You'll need to press it into the bottle's mouth with enough force to form a seal and then keep that pressure applied while you turn the whole arrangement upside down. Make sure it stays together and while you're moving it around. Otherwise, you'll leak untreated water all over your hands and the device. The Ultra model discussed earlier also has a rubber plug style base. Sterapen does make a model specifically marketed for the outdoors called the Adventurer Opti. In a tacit acknowledgement of the challenge that turbidity can present to UV disinfection, there's an optical eye that shines a light into your water and detects if the cloudiness is too much for safe treatment. Unfortunately, this model does not have the rubber plug base. It's not even round. It's more of an oblong profile that you won't be able to use in this way. And the other model of potential interest to the backpacker is the Sterapin Ultralight. At only 76 grams, it's both the lightest and smallest option they offer. But again, its base is not suited to sealing the mouth of an inverted bottle. So in short, ultraviolet disinfection does work, and it provides inactivation for all three pathogen types. However, log reductions for a prescribed 90-second dose of UV are subpar compared to the reductions available from a dose of chemicals or a single pass through a filter. Unfortunately, the solution isn't that complicated. You just zap the water again, even a third time if it seems necessary. 
Maybe you're asking, why would I need a third dose if two get me over the EPA minimum? Well, because a minimum is just that. It's the very least you need to qualify for what amounts to a bureaucratic standard. And that doesn't make it the most reduction that you could stand to benefit from in the field. And log reductions beyond the EPA minimum continue to provide higher and higher levels of safety. Or another way to say that is, they reduce your chances of getting sick by more and more. So again, for perspective on the actual microbiological risks from drinking backcountry waters, see parts 3 and 4. So another reason for a potential third dose is because quite possibly the water you'll find outdoors isn't as clear as tap water. In the canteen study, which also used the EPA's mildly cloudy challenge water, even two 90-second doses only produced about two and a half logs of reduction, less than what a single dose did in the general test water. You'd at least want a third dose in a case like that, maybe even a fourth depending on just how dirty the water looks. And though it isn't a rigorous scientific study, Dr. Annie did a neat home experiment that helps make the point visually. She went to the neighborhood lake and gathered some water then swabbed samples onto agar growth gel to see how much bacteria would propagate. The untreated lake water showed its spots where healthy bacteria were happily growing and spreading in maybe a couple of dozen places. And the disc swabbed with water that had undergone one steropen treatment still clearly shows at least three patches of spreading bacteria. And this was with water that didn't really look that bad. And then she decided to make a deliberately contaminated germ water by adding a small amount of mud from her backyard to purified water. Still, it didn't look anywhere near as bad as some of the actual water sources you can come across on the trail. This time, the disc with untreated water was so infected you can't even identify or count individual spots. It's just a solid mass of teeming bacteria. Now look at the water after just one dose of UV. Still hundreds and hundreds of dots. So after two treatments, there still seems to be a few flecks here and there, but it looks a whole lot better. So that brings up a point to keep in mind when you're in the field making a decision about how many treatments to administer to a liter of collected water. Turbidity interferes with the effective operation of UV disinfection, but it's not directly the cause of your water being unsafe to drink. What you see as cloudiness is mostly organic and mineral solids floating in the water. Those might not be pleasant to drink, but they aren't necessarily harmful. And while a dirty look may correlate with microbiological contamination, you can still easily get sick from water that looks clear because the germs themselves are essentially invisible. So in terms of the safety hazards with using UV disinfection, I mentioned previously the military study discussing the possibility of mercury poisoning should the bulb break while you were treating water. However, what about the UV light itself? Remember that the peak band with a low pressure mercury vapor lamp is at 254 nanometers. That puts it in the UVC range, which is an even more damaging wavelength than the sunburn causing UVA and UVB. And normally we don't have to worry about UVC burns because that stuff is effectively filtered out by the atmosphere. But what happens when you start waving a UVC flashlight around camp, one that's powerful enough to begin disrupting the DNA of living cells in a matter of seconds? Well, to start with, SteriPen won't let you do that. The pens are equipped with probes that detect submersion. It won't light up until you've stuck the thing into water. No, you won't be able to use it like a black light. So much for those raves you were planning on throwing in your tent at night. But you may be asking, what about the light that shines through these transparent bottles? Well, that happens to be yet another issue addressed in the travel medicine study. They did a spectral analysis of the light emitted by the SteriPen's bulb. And as stated, the bulk of emissions are in the UVC range at about 254 nanometers. But there are also trace amounts in the UVA and B bands as well. And the authors demonstrated that common bottle materials such as PET and glass filter out the entire UVB and C fraction of the spectrum and most of the UVA. So it can thus be concluded that there is no danger to the eyes when watching the SteriPens bulb through the wall of a plastic or glass bottle during irradiation. Now, the study did note that if you're using the pen in a larger container, some of the UV, B, and C exits through the water's surface. They weren't, however, able to measure the amount. It will depend upon the angle of vision. And you could, of course, just cover your eyes, but a pair of glasses will also work. Certain UV blocking sunglasses are good, but even just common reading glasses, like the ones I'm wearing right now, 
will protect you. Remember, it only takes that thin wall of plastic to completely block that short wavelength UVC. So just a reminder, I'm not sponsored by anybody. I don't get any kind of kickbacks or incentive from anywhere at all, and I have to buy all my own gear at regular price. And that being said, for the most part, the various Steropen models are the only real game in town, at least from a backpacking perspective. Though, I did find a couple of UV bottles worth briefly mentioning. The Lark Pure Viz is a stainless steel bottle that comes in two sizes, in both insulated and single wall options. Instead of a mercury lamp with a breakable quartz bulb, it comes with an essentially shatterproof ultraviolet LED embedded in the cap. There's a built-in USB rechargeable lithium polymer battery that's said to be good for about one to two months. The PureViz seems aimed more at the urban crowd for daily use. It turns on automatically every two hours to keep the bottle stink free. It's generally designed to maintain the freshness of already clean water, like after you fill it up from a faucet. The reason the battery might last that long is that normal mode is just a six second burst once in a while. They did include an adventure mode though, which I thought deserved a closer look. This is supposed to be for when you gather water outdoors from natural sources like when hiking. So adventure mode is a more robust three minute cycle, which is equivalent at least in terms of time to two full 90 second SteriPen treatments. Heron's lab performed tests of the Lark bottle and the efficacy of its three minute treatment. In six different runs against E. coli, average log reduction just met the minimum six required by the EPA for bacteria, though if you look at the individual test results, it sometimes dipped below that. There was no mention of the use of challenge water or how the bottle would perform in the event of turbidity, but as you can see, any loss of reduction is going to drop below the EPA minimums. And then lastly, I found a lab report for another ultraviolet LED bottle cap system called the Pergati One. And they tested using the preset application cycle of 55 seconds without agitation to simulate a worst case condition. And though the authors concluded that the bottles satisfactorily inactivated the target pathogenic bacteria, the actual results are a better way to judge for yourself. Reduction for E. coli was a little over four logs, which is far short of the six log standard for bacteria. It was even worse for other types of pathogens. But interestingly, they also tested to see how well log reduction was maintained after a three-day stagnation period. And look what happened. From an initial value of 4.4, after three days of sitting there, the log reduction dropped to 3.53. So in other words, over time, there were more active bacteria in the water than right after treatment. And remember that these log removal values, the percent reductions are always made up of a series of nines. It's never a perfect 100. It means there's always a percentage of living germs that remain. So even in a dark bottle, those surviving germs aren't continuing to die off after you zap them. They're actually multiplying and regrowing the colony. So in this case, 0.87 logs worth, which is several times as many. This is an illustration of what's meant by saying that UV provides no residual protection the way chemical treatments do. Well, to be fair, I should point out that filters don't provide any residual protection to store water either. It's just something to keep in mind if you'll be treating multiple days worth of water for a long carry through the desert or for an extended stay at a dry camp. Now, I'm not sure if they're making the Pergati one anymore. I couldn't find them for sale anywhere, and at least one website claims they're no longer in production. Okay, that's it. Time for the summary. As with any water treatment method, there are both advantages and disadvantages to UV disinfection. Some of the advantages include broad spectrum effect, and by that I mean it works on all three pathogen types. Some of the most popular water filters on trail, for example, won't work on viruses. So relatively lightweight when considered on a per liter basis. The SteriPen Ultralight is 76 grams, and it's said to be good for 8,000 activations. And even if it requires two activations per liter, that's still 4,000 liters. The max is only rated for 450 liters, for about the same weight. Cost. The max is $49.99, while a SteriPen Ultra runs $129.95. But again, on the basis of how much water is treatable, the max has an operating cost of $0.11 cents per liter, while the SteriPen is only 3 By the way, presently, this currently unavailable listing was the only thing I could find. There don't seem to be any SteriPens available at this moment. And I don't think they've all been discontinued. Hopefully it's just a temporary thing. 
Next, UV adds no unpleasant taste and won't leave chemical byproducts the way some of the iodine and chlorine tablets can. And it's also somewhat faster. Chemical treatments can take from 30 minutes to 4 hours depending on the pathogen and the temperature. And two 90 second UV doses is just 3 minutes per liter. Now the Max has an initial rating of 2 minutes per liter, but filters are notorious for slowing down over time. And some of the disadvantages include it's fragile. The bulb can break, which not only will render the device inoperable, but could create a mercury poisoning hazard as well. So carrying a backup method is highly recommended. And battery life is limited. While Sterapen claims 50 cycles per charge, Outdoor Gear Lab found that 25 cycles was more realistic. And if it takes 2 cycles per liter to make water safe at 6 liters per day of hiking, you're looking now at only about 2 days of use per charge. It only gets worse if the weather's cold, so backup batteries or a charging bank are highly recommended. Also, it's an electronic device, and that means you need to be prepared and know how to operate it, which includes being able to interpret the many patterns of flashing lights it may display during operation. And if you can't read the error signals, you may not be able to figure out why the thing's not working. It also means that malfunctions can occur seemingly without cause, as in the case of the Outdoor Gear Lab review. In his book Trail Tested, Justin Lichter has a tip for users who experience a stair pen that won't work for an unknown reason. And if it's not the battery or the bulb and you're pushing all the buttons correctly, check for water around the sensors. He says you should try drying it off, maybe even leave it in the sun for a while to see if that helps. It can become less effective with use. As the batteries die, they lose voltage. Lower voltage can mean lower lamp brightness, which lessens the disinfection strength. Also, the bulb itself can lose brightness over time and become less effective as that happens. Disinfection performance can be hampered by the condition of the water. Fairly low levels of turbidity can begin to shield pathogens from the UV light, and even mildly cloudy water can significantly reduce pathogen inactivation rates. For all but the clearest water, a pre-filter is highly recommended. Temperature can also affect performance. Cold water takes longer to treat. UV doesn't remove anything from the water. It can't improve the look, color, smell, or taste, and it won't reduce particulates, toxins, or heavy metals. Proper use is essential. It's not what I would call a foolproof method. Be mindful of your bottle type and the method that's going to be required to properly agitate during treatment. It's also better suited to small batches and individual use. If you've got 10 liters to treat nightly for a large group, you might want to consider a larger capacity gravity system instead. So there's at least a small risk of UV exposure through the top of larger open containers, though this is easily dealt with by wearing glasses while the lamp is on. And then lastly, be mindful that the UV exposure isn't designed to treat any residual water that may be in the mouth of your bottle, or around the threads, or in the cap. So it's recommended to either wipe those areas dry or splash them clear with some of the disinfected water after treatment. Right, so I try to just put that stuff out there so everybody can judge for themselves whether the pros outweigh the cons. But if you're interested in my personal conclusions, here's where I'm at. I see the negatives as eating away much of the advantages given by the positives. And the arguments about weight per liter look to the future of all water ever to be treated. But pack weight goes trip by trip. And on any given outing, I could carry a 71 gram filter or a 76 gram UV pen. But if I carry the fragile, fallible pen, I'll also need a pre-filter and backup batteries and a backup method in case anything else goes wrong for any number of reasons. So for that particular trip, this is smaller and lighter than all of this. Reliability is also a big issue for me personally. I'm careful with my gear, so I'm not super concerned about breaking the thing myself. But the possibility of malfunction is a significant deterrent, and I try to keep my setup as bomb-proof and battery-free as possible. And then there's just the issue of performance in worst-case scenarios, because that's when you're going to need it the most. UV devices are admittedly designed only for water that is already relatively clear. So in the case of my favorite cow puddle example, I don't want to drink that without filtering it first, regardless of how many times you want to zap it with UV. But if I'm going to be carrying this anyway, what do I need this for? Now, if you carry one of these popular bacterial filters and you want a viral post-treatment, maybe the pen is an option. But this is lighter, less finicky, and cheaper, and you need to back up to the pen anyway. So again, 
why carry this? If you're going to be routinely treating for viruses, I'd carry an actual virus filter. If virus treatment is just a backup in case you come across some really skeezy water, I'd bring along some tabs. So I guess I end up agreeing with other reviews. The pen may be better suited as a travel accessory for treating hotel water in places where there could be biological hazards. Not so much for the backcountry, but that's just my opinion and it's why I got one of these to play around with, but I haven't yet taken it on trail. As always, thanks very much for watching and I very much appreciate your time.